Uh, last year I tried to get Dr. Fluke here, but the timing uh, wasn't right for him to be able to be here. So uh, this year we organized a symposium around his schedule. <laughs> so uh, it's really a delight to have him here. And uh, uh, when I read his first paper, I was incredibly impressed because uh, Dr. Fluke is an oncologist. What in the world is he doing with chronic fatigue syndrome patients? And it's just simply because I think he basically accidentally met one and realized it was a serious problem and he had ideas about how he might help them. And, uh, and so he took that on. And not only that, but trying to understand the disease meant he had to also do a lot of things that were very remotely connected to oncology. And, uh, uh, and, but he, he did that. And uh, the last meeting in London, uh, when I was there, um, I think the most impressive of all the talks came from Norway. Uh, and Norway doesn't account for more than 50% of the population of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they've done a fantastic job, and I think it was all because of Dr. Flug's initial that uh, Norway has now been a, a leading country in their research in, in this field. So it's really a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. You. So uh, thank you, Ron, for those very kind words. And uh, thank you for inviting me and from the OMF for inviting me. Truly, it has been three wonderful days to take part in this uh, working group meeting. Uh, for me as a clinician, also trying to do some translational research, it's been so uh, interesting to talk to some of the most excellent researchers in, in the field. So thank you all to the researchers who came to the meeting, also to telling me and learning me. I have a lot to think about when we go home on the airplane and when we meet our colleagues at home, trying to move the field forward. So what uh, I will do in the next uh, 25 minutes is to tell you a little, about, little bit about our clinical trials and a little bit about the lab laboratory work that we have done, um, some of the metabolic features of MECFS that we see. And I'll call it a struggle for energy because that's something I think that the patients describe to me. It's, not, it's like they struggle. So um, this is uh, just a picture of some of our uh, group in Bergen. And uh, to the right, you can see uh, the list of the study center, trial centers that has been uh, taking part in the clinical studies and some of the um, groups that we have collaborated on so far. And I, I'm happy to say that I have made several connections these three days with other researchers that we will continue to work together with. So in, in Bergen, we tried to combine work on clinical trials in MECFS and trying to combine that with transitional work using samples from patients, blood samples mainly, taken at baseline and taken at serial, uh, at intervals throughout the trials to build a biobank. And then we aim to increase the understanding of disease mechanisms and try to be part in the efforts to develop rational treatment. So it's a very tight cooperation between the clinic, the clinical trials, the biobank, and laboratory work in which we have a growing a group of uh, scientists also in Bergen um, at the universities taking part in this. So the focus for this talk is to give you a brief overview of some of the clinical trials and also a little bit on the translational work. And I must tell you that uh, the rituximab trial and the cyclophosphamide trial, they have not been published yet, so I'm not able to, <coughs> to give you details from these studies. I, I apologize for that, but it's not been uh, out in, uh, in uh, published yet. So why did I get int interested in uh, MECFS? And that was uh, back in 2004, and the next few years, we had observation of patients with long-standing MECFS who got cancer or lymphoma, 
and who independently came to us and told us that this is doing something to my ME-CFS disease. And uh, the first time, maybe I just registered, then uh, okay. But uh, then it happened again, and really uh, got interested to see if this was uh, something, uh, this was an observation that could tell us something important about the disease. So in, in the first years, we had only two such observations. One was a patient in 2004 with Hodgkin lymphoma who received chemotherapy. Uh, including the drugs iphosphamide, which is very similar to cyclophosphamide. Uh, in 2004, we also saw a patient uh, with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. In uh, 2007, sorry, a patient with non-Hodgkin lymphoma who uh, received uh, uh, chemotherapy with cyclophosphamide together with a monoclonal antibody rituximab for lymphoma, and both of these patients reported that there was a major change in their ME-CFS symptoms. Then we decided to, to track both of these leads. Could it be the chemotherapy? Could it be the B-cell depletion therapy with rituximab that uh, made this difference to the patients? So we decided to investigate those in separate clinical trials, small trials initially, just to get some uh, thoughts about this could be something worthwhile pursuing. I can tell you that if you look back now, 2004 to 2018, we have seen a total of eight patients who have independently reported benefit from cancer treatment on their ME-CFS patients, patients with long-standing ME-CFS. And most of these have actually received chemotherapy uh, with uh, cyclophosphamide or iphosphamide. So, to give you a brief overview of the previous rituximab studies, we first did a small pilot case series in 2008 and 2009. We just gave three patients a single infusion with rituximab and followed their clinical course, trying to register what happened to them. Uh, this had a transient uh, symptom improvement. Then we did a small randomized phase two study, which was published in 2011. There were 30 patients, we followed them for 12 months, and they had two infusions of rituximab uh, and, uh, for the two first weeks, and then just followed. And in this study, the primary endpoint, which was at four months, it was negative. There was no difference between this, the placebo and the rituximab group at four months, so the study was negative. But there were separation of the curves, at the later in the study, between six and 12 months, at the secondary endpoints. So we were uh, unsure if this was a sign of clinical activity that we should, and, but, uh, but we decided to do an open label phase two study with rituximab maintenance therapy. That was a, an exploratory study trying to get um, more knowledge about the mechanisms and uh, to prepare for a later randomized study. It's a big limitation when you do an open label study in this disease because it, you cannot have any proof for a clinical effect. But you can have ideas about the tolerability and the feasibility, look at the response rate and possible toxicity, but it's no proof of effect. So we did this study with 29 patients and we gave them six infusions during the first 15 months and follow them for three years. Uh, I'll show you uh, in the next slide a little bit just to sum up this. But uh, to give you the history of what we have uh, done so far, we have also uh, studied cyclophosphamide because in fact that was mo what most of the patients had got who had independently reported benefit to us in our cancer clinic. Um, so in cyclophosphamide, we first did a case series of three patients. It's unpublished. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then an open label phase two study, also without the placebo group, which is a limitation. And followed them for 18 months, now up to 30 months with 40 patients. So this is what I will tell you a little bit about. Just to show you some of the data from the open label phase two study what is called the KTS-2 trial, in which patients had the rituximab maintenance therapy. And you can see these are the SF36, which is a
questionnaire uh, with uh, can give you information about physical function. As you can see uh, in the upper panel, the vitality, bodily pain, social function, and mental health. And the red ones are the patients that really seem to respond clearly. The green ones are the moderate responders, and the blue ones are 10 patients with no response at all. And you can see from the curves, uh, I don't know which side to point on, but if you look at the curves, the time axis on the, is on the x-axis. And you can see that for the first three months, there's absolutely no change in uh, these uh, quality, health-related uh, quality of life parameters. But then you have increases, especially in the group that seem to respond. And in the time window, 15 to 30 months, they reach high values for these SF36 scores. The group, which was half of those included, um, uh, both for physical function, vitality, social function, and uh, bodily pain. So was this a true effect of the drug, of rituximab? We can't say because it's an open label study. Or there are major limitations, such as the outcome measures, which was mainly self-reported in this study. Could it be natural variation of symptoms over time, placebo mechanisms, or a selection bias that we hadn't had included patients, although fulfilling the Canadian criteria by chance shouldn't be representative for a larger group. We don't know for sure. So we were discussing, is there a subgroup of ME patients that benefit from B-cell depletion therapy? And we inter interpreted the observed responses or improvements are probably related to the intervention. We had no responses before four months, which is uh, not typical uh, for a major placebo effect. But as we know from oncology and also from other uh, clinical trials in, in autoimmune diseases, um, they, such studies have shown that it's very important to do a larger randomized and placebo-controlled trial before you can make conclusions. Especially, maybe in diseases such as MECFS with subjective and self-reported outcome measures. But it's no doubt that the patients improved in these studies because the questionnaires, the SF36 forms, and measurements of physical activity level, for instance, by armbands, measuring steps per 24 hours, all showed the same. Patients improved. But what was the cause of the observed improvement? That's why we have performed Rituximi, which is a multicenter, national, randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled phase three trial with either Rituximab or placebo, six infusions in total during the first 12 months and follow-up for 24 months. 151 patients randomized. Um, and the code for intervention was relieved in October 2017. The inclusion criteria were Canadian criteria, age 18 to 65. And we had a lot of um, questionnaires to get, give uh, several endpoints. And the primary endpoint was self-reported based on registrations of symptoms by patients every two weeks. But we also tried to measure physical activity uh, objectively by sensewear armbands. And we did sub-studies trying to evaluate endothelial function, cardiopulmonary exercise tests, and gastrointestinal function, both at baseline and repeated after um, 18 months to see. Now, uh, as I told you, the Rituximi uh, trial is, uh, in, uh, is being con considered by a journal, so I cannot uh, give you details of the outcome. But we have stated in public before, be, for ethical reasons, that the study was negative, that we couldn't find a significant difference between the rituximab and placebo groups. And the reason why we did that, because we knew there were off-label treatment around the, in the world, patients taking the treatment outside clinical trials. I cannot give you any more details about the study now, because it has to await for the uh, uh, final consideration by the journal. So I will tell you a little bit about the cyclomide trial, which is an open-label 
phase two trial with cyclophosphamide in MECFS based on observations of several patients with uh, long-standing MECFS who got cancer and reported benefit on their symptoms. We did first a pilot study in 2014, gave three ME patients six infusions with four weeks intervals. One of them was a non-responder, one patient responded for approximately one year, and one severe patient which was bedridden and had less than 300 steps per 24 hours. She had a long-lasting response for almost four years now, and can still walk five to 10 kilometers several times each week. She's not completely healthy, but she seemed to improve. So that was a pilot study, and we have therefore perform, performed an open label, label, label phase two trial, and that's again, exploratory study, trying to learn something about the mechanisms and to see for the feasibility, so that we can be able to design a new randomized trial. Uh, uh, that's our, our hope. So this is a limitation. 40 patients were given six cyclophosphamide infusions with four weeks intervals and been followed now for almost three years. And the question uh, we, we ask, is cyclophosphamide associated with the clinical benefit? What are the side effects and the toxicity and the tolerability? Cyclophosphamide is a cytotoxic drug that's used in oncology but it also had broad immune modulatory properties. So it's also used in rheumatology, uh, modulating inflammation. So the inclusion criteria were like this. Age 18 to 65 years, there had to be disease duration at least two years. And we did not include mild patients. I don't mean that mild, mild MSCFS is a pro big problem also, but we tried to take patients that were either moderate or severe, or moderate to severe MECFS, but not those that were unable to care for themselves at all, not the very severe group. 40 patients, and this is an exploratory study, 26 patients were treatment naive, and 14 had received rituximab previously. The mean age was 42 years almost, and half of the included patients had been sick for a long time with a disease duration more than 10 years. And the outcome measures were similar to what we did in Rituximi, except that we measured steps more often, at now, both at baseline 9, 12, 18, and 24 months. So the data have been analyzed, and the manuscript is in preparation. I can tell you that the response data are interesting, but we cannot state it yet because it's unpublished. The toxicity has been acceptable, but with discomfort for patients due to the cytotoxic drugs, especially the first four months. So cyclophosphamide is a cytotoxic drug that can affect fertility. There's a 15 chance of premature menopause in women more than 35 years from this schedule. And there can be rare but severe and not negligible side effects, which may occur. We haven't seen this in this study, but if you treat enough large number of patients, you can see more severe side effects. So we will have to be very cautious in interpreting the response data when we will see that when we publish it. And I think that cyclophosphamide should not be used outside clinical trials for MECFS until before we have done a randomized study and shown that if there is a true effect of the drug. So what we are doing now is to do extensive laboratory investigations using serial samples from patients in these trials, trying to strengthen or weaken the case for a new randomized trial with cyclophosphamide versus placebo in ME. Is there a true effect? Or is it placebo mechanism? Is it natural symptom variation over time? These are very important questions. Uh, that we need to address. And we have been wondering, due to, due to the still unknown pathomechanisms of MECFS and unknown etiology, is really the more unspecific immune modulation by cyclophosphamide, which we know affect different lymphocyte subsets, both T, B, and K cells, is that in fact an advantage in MECFS compared to rituximab, which is a very broad, B cell, narrow and specific B cell depleting agent, because we don't know yet the precise disease mechanisms. 
So for the last uh, 12 minutes, is that, uh, yeah. Hmm? I, I'm okay? Yes. Yeah. I will tell you a little bit about uh, research focus from the laboratory studies. This was a quick overview of the clinical trials. And I think one advantage of doing clinical trials is that we get very carefully characterized and carefully followed patients throughout the study, standardizing of biobank sampling, registrations, everything is put into system. I think that is uh, some, some, uh, is, is a, is a uh, good thing. So what we have uh, been asking ourselves based on the laboratory data that I will uh, discuss with you, is there in fact an ineffective utilization of glucose as a proper fuel for the uh, uh, citric acid cycle, the TCA cycle in MECFS? And we have been wondering if this uh, includes a reversible and functional inhibition of a, an important enzyme, the pyruvate dehydrogenase PDH enzyme. I'll show you wh what it is, uh, just introduce you to the thought. This PDH enzyme catalyzes the irreversible conversion of pyruvate, which is the endpoint of glycolysis, gly glycolysis to acetyl coenzyme A, which enter the citric acid cycle for fueling. And is the patient, do the patients try to cope with this uh, inhibition with an increased use of substrates that can fuel the TCA cycle independent of this enzyme, such as specific amino acids and fatty acids? And we also think that maybe the majority of the met metabolite alterations that we see are secondary and compensatory to such an obstruction in uh, in a way, in this central energy pathway. An important question to me is also, what is the link between the immune system and then this alteration of the central energy pathway? We thought it was the B cells, but the case for the B cells are at least weakened by the result of our study. So it could be the T cells, is it the innate immune system? How is the link between the immune system and uh, these energy metabolite alterations. So this is a, a very simplified overview of the metabolism of carbohydrates to energy. Sugars, which is carbohydrates, are metabolized uh, through the glycolysis to uh, pyruvate. And this enzyme, PDH, uh, is in the mitochondria. And we, with the green uh, square that you can see, we are suspecting that this is impaired, probably as a part of a bigger picture, some kind of metabolic switch or change that uh, most many of the other researchers have uh, also discussed in these uh, uh, few days, which is uh, very interesting. Some kind of modulation of the meta metabolic pattern. And we know that uh, if you have lack of oxygen, uh, you can have lactic acid. And if you have oxygen present in the mitochondria, you can have a TCA cycle uh, activation and uh, energy, which is ATP. And you can see that the specific amino acids and fatty acids, they can fuel the TCA cycle downstream of this PDH enzyme. So the little bit more uh, complex picture of the same thing, the central energy pathway, glucose taken up by the cells, converted in glycolysis to pyruvate, which is converted to acetyl coenzyme A, entering the TCA cycle, and giving energy in the presence of oxphos uh, with oxygen, uh, ATP. And the, you can see again, amino acids, fatty acids, and ketones, are substrates for the TCA cycle, which are not dependent of the PDH enzyme. So we first focused on amino acids, and there has been several previous studies using, looking at amino acid metabolism in MECFS. Several of those were present at the meeting. We have uh, several studies from the Australian group showing that you have reduced levels of several amino acids, both in the study from 2007, uh, 2012 and 2015 from Christopher Armstrong and his co-workers. Navio paper from 2016 showed that there were re reduced plasma levels of branched amino acids, proline and arginine. Uh, 
And we had our paper from 2016, Metabolic Profiling Indicates an Impaired PDH Function in ME-CFS. And what did we look for first? We looked for all the amino acids in serum and the derived amino acids that uh, we can measure and hypo hypothesized that this disturbed central energy metabolism can cause changes in the serum amino acid profile. And we know that serum amino acids, they are a little bit, uh, can fluctuate and they are dependent on diet and habits, uh, diet habits and, and uh, a little bit uh, uh, can vary from over time, so we have also measured them several times during, during the follow-up in the studies. But um, what's a uh, uh, good thing about the clinical trials is that we have the data from disease severity, disease duration, we know the physical activity measured by steps, we know the quality of life, and we analyzed 153 non-fasting patients and 102 healthy controls. And what we saw was that the sum of all the amino acids that can convert to pyruvate, we looked at how can amino acids be used for energy when they are catabolized. We saw that there were no difference, in, especially in female patients, there were no difference for the amino acid that can enter at the pyruvate level. But for amino acids that can enter at the acetyl coenzyme A level or that can replenish the intermediates of the TCA cycle, they were significantly lower in female patients. Maybe indicating that these female patients use these amino acids as sources for energy. That's what we are thinking. In male patients, we saw that there were increased level of amino acid called 3-methylhistidine, which is a marker of endogenous protein catabolism. Men have usually more muscles than women and may use uh, muscle catabolism as a, a, a source for energy. So we were hypothesizing that there seems to be an increased use of alternative substrates for a TCA cycle oxidation and energy. And is this possibly as part of a bigger picture due to an obstruction in the effective glucose oxidation, uh, including a functional and reversible obstruction at the PDH level. And then we try to measure the enzymes and then we, uh, uh, that we are known to inhibit the PDH enzyme. We measured that in uh, blood cells at the RNA level, and we saw that these enzymes, PDK1, 2, and 4, they inhibit the PDH enzyme. Um, uh, they were upregulated, so it seemed to fit with the hypothesis. So there could be other explanations for this. There could be fasting or diet habits, but we saw that the triglyceride levels, they are equal in ME and CFS patients, indicating that there's no big difference in prandial, postprandial status. And we see similar findings from other research groups also present at the meeting. But it is important to know that this is a cross-sectional study design, therefore it's suggesting mechanism. And some people claim that this is just because they are lying down uh, or much as the rest. But uh, when we look for these uh, associations, for instance, to the physical activity level or the d disease severity, we cannot see uh, clear association. So it, it's associated with the disease, and it's probably not deconditioning based on our data. And then, just to um, uh, give you a small snapshot of the metabolism data we have, have for fatty acids, I will tell you that uh, a little bit about that. Because if there is an impaired PDH function, uh, as I have told you about, we would then uh, um, expect that there is an increased conversion of pyruvate to lactate if you stress the system and put the patients under strain. And that's what patients are telling us. They seem to have sore muscles and quickly a, a, a feeling of lactate in their muscles. Reduced ATP production and this energy deprivation. And we would expect that they, in addition to using amino acids from serum, also use fatty acids. 
which is a major source for TCA oxidation and energy. And therefore, we have analyzed a lot of an, uh, fatty acids, uh, among many other metabolites, trying to underpin this data. And just this is a, just a snapshot as examples from the saturated fatty acids that we have measured in MECFS patients, and you can see it divided by women and men. Most of these fatty acids are down-regulated, uh, reduced in serum levels, um, uh, especially the short and medium-chained fatty acids in both gender. So we, we don't have to go into the details. And we looked at the TCA cycle intermediates, which are uh, part of the citric acid cycle. And these are also reduced. Some of them are equal to healthy, such as citrate. And in accordance with the model that we are thinking, there's a slight increase in pyruvate, both in, uh, in, in the MECFS patient. That would fit with an obstruction at the PDH level. So to conclude this, we think that this is our uh, features of a struggle for energy by the patients. There is a putative PDH inhibition, inhibition with change of substrates for how the patients try to get the acetyl coenzyme A, which they take from amino acids and fatty acids. It, it resembles physiological mechanisms that are activated by fasting or starvation, and it resembles mechanisms that are activated by endurance exercise. And I think that in MECFS patients, these mechanisms appear to be activated at rest or at minimal exertion. Not, uh, it's not a normal physiologic regulation. So this impairment of the central energy pathway seems to be present in both male and female patients. Well, I think that the two genders have different way of coping with this. They have different the compensatory mechanisms, which are partly uh, sex specific. So if there is a metabolic obstruction at, in the central energy pathway, possibly including the PDH level, it can describe some of the features that patients at least tell me. The devastating lack of energy, they feel this devastating total lack of energy, and the lactate accumulation, accumulation of the minimal exertion, which has also been, been measured. It looks like patients use anaerobic metabolism, so in some, somehow it resembles hypoxia. Uh, which could be real or could be perceived due to signaling disturbances. So we are wondering if there is an ineffective glucose utilization, a switch in the metabolic pattern uh, as part of the mechanisms. And it's important then to understand why this occurs. Somehow it has to do with the immune system, I think, because in 70% this disease uh, develops uh, after infection. So this is the last slide, just the same figure. Uh, the lack of energy, ineffective glucose utilization, lactic acid production, use of alternative substrates to try to keep the energy levels up. That's what we are thinking. And um, this is part of a bigger picture that we, and that's the good thing being at such a very nice meeting. Hearing from excellent researchers from different groups telling us uh, how they look at this, and we find common things. We find, uh, okay, we will have to adjust this one. And during the next year, I really hope that we uh, both can be, uh, give you more information on the clinical trials, maybe we are doing new trials, and I'm sure at the mechanistic level we will have more information about the pathogenesis, I think so. So thank you.